Welcome to another episode of Talks for a Magical Monday, the weekly podcast of the Heralds of the Gospel. I'm your host, Brother Gustavo. For those who are not familiar with the Heralds, the Heralds of the Gospel are a community active in the Catholic Archdiocese of Toronto, as well as several other cities across Canada. Founded by Monsignor Jean Cladias, the Heralds comprise priests, religious, brothers and sisters, and lay people since their pontifical recognition in 2001 by Pope John Paul II. And for those who are familiar with the Heralds, this podcast features the talks following the Heralds' weekly rosary at St. Patrick's Parish in Schomburg, Ontario, where the brothers share some consoling and encouraging thoughts precisely geared to those dreaded beginnings of a probably hard week called Mondays. If you want to know more about the origin of the podcast, please stop right here. Go back and listen to episode number one. So even if today it's not Monday, but you're still commuting or doing chores, take heart brighten your perspectives and enjoy today's talk recorded at the Heralds of the Gospel House in Schomburg. The topic, Overcoming the Fear of Suffering, with Brother Justin Bonian. Welcome then to Talks for a Magical Monday, the weekly podcast of the Heralds of the Gospel. Welcome to one more episode of these marvelous, mystical, and magical Mondays. Uh, This is Brother Justin of the Heralds of the Gospel, and again, we are recording here in Schaumburg, but not in the parish church of St. Patrick's, but rather in the Heralds community home here found in Schaumburg because of the current situation of lockdown and our uh, uh, sensation and, and state of being in this phase two of this. Um, Today, I want to uh, embrace something which, uh, during this point of the lifting of the uh, conditions applied um, by the provincial government on gathering, um, have slowly but surely been lifted, are being lifted, but something has uh, approached and come up, which is uh, becoming more and more evident. And that that is becoming evident is the universal fear, which is overtaking most people, and especially our Catholics. And that fear is keeping people away from the return to both the sacraments and the attending of Mass, of course, principally. The source and summit of Christian life is the Eucharist found in Mass, of course. So, um, today I wanted to to look at something else. I'm going to uh, really be jumping out of our more chronological sense of talking about uh, either the liturgy of the week or the liturgy of the day or something like that. I'm going to jump to, it's in this year, but I'm going to jump to uh, the 22nd Sunday of Ordinary Time. That's which this gospel is found. And I wanted to use it because we are encountering this very problem with our Catholics. So, Let me just help you uh, put ourselves in situation. Uh, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16, is fascinating. Matthew's Gospel in chapter 16 brings us to great realities, uh, brings us to even greater uh, uh, paradigm shifts. So imagine the Jew, the, the, the... Apostles have been traveling with Jesus. They have been traveling with him for three years. They're looking for the kingdom of Israel. 
At the beginning of chapter 16, we have the ones who don't believe. We have the Sadducees and the scribe and the scribes and the Pharisees. These three groups don't get along very well. Uh, actually, they hate each other because they are um, politically and historically on different ends of the stick. But when they encounter Jesus, they tend to unite. And Christ can tells the apostles to be wary of the leaven of the Pharisees. And the apostles, of course, get this off to the wrong point in which they look at it as though it is that um, they had forgotten bread. So their their vision of Christ is very low. Um, Then we have them go... um, to the, the famous um, spot in Galilee, which has this, um, this, this kind of cave, which was, according to the Greeks, one of the entrances into the domain of Hades. And Christ makes this uh, question to them, who do they say I am? And Peter answers correctly. He goes to the point that it is that he is the Christ, the son of the living God. But we fail to see how much of a radical statement that was for a Jew. A Jews didn't believe in a trinity, um, and, and the fact that you're acknowledging he is God is so revolutionary and so strong, right? But this is where we're going to be today. We're going to be right after this declaration. We're going to have this declaration in which Jesus uh, says to Peter, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will never prevail against it. Now, that is, it's amazing. But right afterwards, we have Jesus telling them about his upcoming death, talking about his passion and death. And with this, comes the famous line of Peter. And Peter tells him and rebukes him, saying, God forbid, Lord, this should ever happen to you. And he turns and says to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, and you are not on the side of God, but of man. Or another way of translating it is, You do not see things as God does, but you see things as man does. Then he tells his disciples, If any man comes to after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me, for whoever save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And for what it profits man to gain the whole world, but to forfeit his own life, and in turn for his life. So we end up with this very interesting um, situation that Jesus has has placed the apostles. And this, right after all this, it's going to be the transfiguration. Okay, so it's not a great, sometimes we have a tendency of really parceling it up and breaking it up. But why am I talking about this? Well, I'm talking about this for one reason. Is the fear that people are in today. The panic that people are in. And of course this is human. Of course it is natural. But one thing about it is that it's not supernatural. It's showing a little bit of a problem of lack of faith. So, you know, we we have this situation, but one thing that we need to do is to overcome the fear of suffering. We have to take away a concept that we are um, within us, and it's natural. And that's the key about it. It is very natural that we fear suffering. We fear. Um, you talk to a, someone who has a toothache and you tell them, oh, yeah, I guess you need to go to the dentist. And if they've had bad experiences with the dentist, they're immediately, God forbid, I do not want to go there. I'm going to suffer. Um, you tell anyone about a, a tragic health problem, immediately it is it's panic. Not empathy, but panic. Um, And what's interesting with all of that is the way in which our Lord talks about it, right? He condemns it very quickly. You know, 
Peter was shocked and concerned and couldn't accept that Jesus was saying this. This is after he's acknowledged him as the son of God. What form of faith does he have? You may ask. If it was your friend and you revealed this precious bit of knowledge to, uh, to a friend and then immediately he turns and he rebukes you, you, being human, like me, would be more in favor of expelling this person from their friendship. This person's not reliable. They could Jesus is suffering was was such a scandal and unacceptable to go to Jerusalem to suffer greatly from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and they will kill him on the third day he will be raised again the kernel of truth is in there which is he's going to be raised but they were waiting for this glorification they were human they were not spiritual yet Peter was still very much Simon. Peter becomes Peter after the resurrection, after the sense of the Holy Spirit. If this was spoken to anyone other than our Lord, you would think the words of our Lord were too much. For example, Jesus referring to Peter as Satan for his concern about Jesus' well-being. But I'm going to go back to this one point here, which is Jesus' words shocked Peter tremendously. And this act of shock was an act of love to help Peter overcome his fear. Now, I wanted to, um, to look at a different aspect because by the way in which we study and the, by the way in which we um our cultures in the West are formed, we're formed on a Greco-Roman basis. And even though we do not respect the gods, they do affect our philosophies and our ways, our emotional modus in encountering sufferings. So I just wanted to quickly go over a few things that are based in Greek mythology to give you an idea how the Greeks and their philosophers would have inculcated the modus of how to approach suffering. And with that, we can understand a little better. So, when the Romans encounter suffering, they, as children of, Ro of Greece, their language, Latin, is a product of Greek, according to the, uh, the Greek uh, heroic poems the Romans are sons of Troy which were crushed by the Greeks and that gave the Greeks uh, a situation which the Romans would want to crush Greece because of that um, the Romans encounter suffering and they move towards the end of their, of their golden era from an emotional response, an Epicurean response, an atomist response, to one that comes to us as Christians, because it would have been around the same era as the great um, early church fathers, a, a principle of Stoicism. Now, Stoics is a situation in which we are purpose-based, and in which suffering becomes something which is there, but it is an obstacle. Something we need to get beyond. You may say the famous Christian Catholic, of course, very Catholic concern, which is when someone's suffering, you immediately say, offer it up. That could be, you could find a Stoic writers which will say exactly the same thing. Again, it is a virtuous act, and Stoicism was all about being the most virtuous person. So, some of the writers who will be um, Stoics would be Livy, um, Seneca, and of course, Marcus Aurelius. But the Greeks looked at it differently. The Greeks embraced the chaos. The Greeks embraced, if you looked at their Greek, the Greek gods and then the Roman versions that were adopted, the Greeks are far more raw. They're far more fleshed out. The Roman ones are far more neat. They're far more put together. But I'm going to look at the Greeks at this point. In the Greeks, we have Ares, 
the sometime dim-witted Neanderthal of the gods, son of Zeus, of course, god of manliness, battle, and bloodlust. But what was interesting was that they would pray to the god of war, Ares, the Greek nations, but they would have in their temples statues, of course, uh, idols to their gods, and they would bind up to the twins of Ares with Aphrodite. They would bound up in Deimos and Phobos. Deimos being the god of fear, and Phobos being the god of panic or phobias. And what's interesting is that they, their idea was that they would bind them up and then after they had prayed for everything, they would bind uh, the feet of Ares so that he would not cause chaos in their war. He would give assistance without the chaos. And his twin sons would be bound to the temple until which time they would come back with the bodies of their defeated enemies and feed them to these two gods. So these gods were, in a sense, man-eaters. Aphrodite would have other children with him, um, be, uh, notably Eros, Ares, which is er, Ares, which is the god of strife. Eros would be the god of passionate love, and Harmonica or or harmony. Harmony being the sense that it was the balance of all of these things put together that causes a form of harmony. We, we need to see this in how we approach our, our situation as, as Christians in front of the question of suffering and pain. Because if we approach the, this question of suffering and pain from a different approach, we end up... Um, Becoming cowards, we end up running. And that's not what we should do with this great emotion. We need to, to do good. Right? The rebuke comes, right? The reaction is of the worldly look at suffering. You talk to people with the whole COVID question. Now, granted... It's a scary thing, and it's, it's very scary because it's something we cannot see. We cannot, um, in a sense, we can't marginalize, we can't see where it is and, 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 and thus uh, avoid it. But we need to keep a supernatural vision of all of these things. What we need to do many a time is to place ourselves in God's hands. The voice, this is something that Monsignor Jean-Claude Diaz said in his commentary on this gospel. He says, a voice, the voice of the human nature prompted earthly prudence still held sway over the apostles and not that the supernaturalized men that they would become after the coming of the Holy Spirit. The natural us causes us to fear, causes us to run, causes us not to encounter the Lord. It's funny that Peter goes from being an unshakable rock to being an obstacle to God's desires. The Prince of the Apostles is referred to as a type of rock, and a very few moments later is referred to as an obstacle. But imagine, referring to him as Satan, that's strong. But in looking more closely, we can see that the Divine Master acted in such a manner as to teach Peter that his, that his rebuke was a fruit of false human wisdom, which could construe a temptation both for Jesus as a man voluntarily subjecting himself to suffering, as well as the apostle himself, who was still incredibly feeble in faith. 
And that is why Christ had to reply, Peter, it was not my Father, it was not my Father in heaven who revealed this to you, but rather flesh and blood. So, at one point, the, the, the knowledge of who Christ was was revealed by the Father. But when he rebukes him and tells him this cannot be, he's saying, that's you. That's many a time that we, I, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it's taken from, um, I forgot which writer it was, but saying that the devil says, you blame me for too much. Many of your own sins are your very own because of your own devices. But what should have been uh, Peter's uh, situation in front of such a, a situation, such a, a dramatic situation? How does Peter fail so soon after being given this gr- high category of responsibility? He fell short by considering that the Father's revelation from a human and naturalistic perceptive. That perception was incorrect. He thought it wasn't grace, but himself. And by doing so, he didn't give grace its possibilities. He assumed that as the Son of God, Jesus would become invincible upon assuming temporal power, and that Israel's political domination would finally be assured. He was blessed when the Father revealed to him, and not flesh and blood, and Satan when he understood from the human and not divine perspectives. And that last quote there is taken from a very famous Spanish commentator with the name of Maldonado, citing Augustine. Although the thought of death of the Messiah would cause perplexities and distress, our own death does also. Our own mortality should give us that certain dread and perplexity. The utter fidelity of the Apostle should have led him to a loving submission to the divine plan that was beyond his own comprehension. Lord, it will happen at thy word. Make us the strength to endure this very difficult trial. How and when, Lord, will thy resurrection take place? That should have been his question, not something else. So, you know, when we look at this question of the pandemic and people who fail to return to church because of fear, we have to look at it through the eyes of God, through the eyes of the eternal, and stop being so grabby on to the natural. All of us are going to die. You know, without heaven, without a glorious body, extremely long life could be a curse. We could look at the novel of Dorian Gray, of Oscar Wilde, or many other works that are based on that, that argument point. When you live very long and you see the results of maybe some of your misgivings or missteps, you spend a long time saying sorry. But we all have an end. And having an end gives us an embrace and a point in which we can encounter the Lord. It's interesting, Jesus, being God for heaven's sakes, could have had a ministry of 20 years, 30 years, 100 years, 1,000 years, 3,000 years. No, sky's the limit. But he decided to give himself a ministry of three years. Three years, not because he needed it, but because the apostles needed it. And you see, all of the best work that they finally began to make steps in the right direction was at the end, and finally, when they finally understood it wasn't them, it was God, and that would be in the Pentecost period.
So for us, embracing this reality is so important. But we should use this fear as something holy, as something sacred, as something to allow us to walk with the Lord, walk with Christ. Knowing that each one of us, as St. Louis de Montfort says in his tremendous work, uh, Friends of the Cross, that each of us has a cross, not only to carry, but to be nailed upon. When we encounter our individual Calvary, the center cross is already occupied. Christ is there. On the right and left side, there are crosses waiting. One is for the repentant. One is for the unrepentant. Both will suffer. It matters on who suffers with the best spirit. So, as I leave you on this Monday, asking that we lose this fear that binds and makes us panic, but gives us a heart that is open to the designs of God, designs of the sacred heart of Jesus, in whose month we are in, to make our hearts like unto his. Let's pray now to the sacred heart, asking for such a grace, but asking his mother, asking the immaculate heart of Mary, that heart that is so united with that of the sacred heart that you may say the two hearts are co-connected. And let's pray a Hail Mary asking for this grace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Most sacred heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Immaculate heart of Mary, pray for us. Salve Maria. And this is all for today's episode recorded live at the Heralds of the Gospel House in Schomburg, Ontario. You can reach us anytime at one of the Heralds' websites, such as heralds.ca forward slash podcast, New Insights Multimedia forward slash podcast, or you can also subscribe on iTunes or anywhere you normally listen to your favorite podcast. And as per now, pray hard, work hard, keep growing in devotion to the Eucharist and our Blessed Mother, evangelize by word and example, and be every day more and more a real herald of the gospel. Oh, yeah.